Hello, everyone. Welcome to the HPL, HPL seminar this week. Today, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Francisca Bosset, who did her undergraduate um, and first master's degree at the Ghent University in Belgium. Um, then in 2013, she went to the Liverpool John Morris University, where she achieved her second <laughs> master's degree. Also last year, she achieved her PhD at the University of Lucerne and Swiss uh, paraplegic research in Switzerland, specialized in biomechanics under the supervision of doctors <laughs> Michael Boninger and Armin Gamperly. Since last month, she has joined in the Herzog lab, working as a postdoc funded by um, Swiss National Science Foundation. While she is in Calgary, she is planning to um, work on quantifying tendon strains and muscle forces uh, continuously and simultaneously during dynamic movements in people using a ship model. She is also interested in investigating risk factor of muscular skeletal injuries and injury prevention as well, especially um, related to how the mechanical and physiological load is related to the damage and injury in soft tissues. When I asked her about one of the biggest accomplishments, she uh, mentioned one of the experiences during her PhD. She said she got lots of feedbacks from um, the participants in her experiment, especially from a, a group of wheelchair users who gave their appreciation to her and her research. I'm not going into the details story yet, but um, because I think we'll see soon as she gives her talk today, but I do believe that those experiences give her a great motivation to keep her um, working on this research field. As a few fun facts, she loves all kinds of sports, especially rowing. Um, during her PhD, she became Swiss champion in the master mixed double and master mixed quads, and also got a couple of medals as well. She loves uh, learning, traveling, and discovering new things and new culture. Today, we will be hearing about her previous work that she did uh, during her PhD, entitled as Effects of Fatiguing Wheelchair Proportion on Risk Factors for Shoulder Pain in Persons with Spinal Cord Injury. Whenever you are ready, Siska. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Sangwon. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to present here today about my uh, PhD work, especially because it's almost exactly one year ago since I defended and uh, I'm really excited to talk about it again and to open the discussion with you at the end. Before I move on, I want to give you a little bit of a background about the Swiss paraplegic research where I conducted my uh, PhD. So the research center is located in this F-shaped building which stands for Forschung, which means research in German. And the Swiss paraplegic research is part of the Swiss paraplegic group, which offers a unique set of services to persons with a spinal cord injury and aims to improve their lives um, from the date of injury to, uh, throughout the end. And the spinal cord injury is an injury to the spinal cord that causes significant loss of functioning below the level of injury. For example, persons with a paraplegia have a lesion level at T2 or below, which will cause significant loss of functioning in their lower extremities and their trunk. And because of this, they may have to use a wheelchair for their mobility. And persons who have a higher lesion level uh, may also have significant loss of functioning in their upper extremities, because of which they may need to um, have additional assistive technology to help them throughout their lives. And from the date of injury or the diagnosis, persons with a spinal cord injury are transferred to the Swiss Paraplegic Center, which is the biggest um, private specialized clinic for persons with a spinal cord injury in Switzerland. And uh, the founder of the Swiss Paraplegic Foundation and the group Guido Atzach really wanted that all the patients would have a view on the lake and if it's a clear day, even on the mountains, and this is one of the things that really shows how they aimed to improve um, the lives of these persons with uh, 
services that range from acute care rehabilitation towards reintegration into life and um, training Paralympic athletes as well as, of course, the research center. And I was in the shoulder health and mobility group that aimed to improve shoulder mobility and functioning in these persons. And shoulder functioning is fundamental for persons who almost completely rely on their upper extremities for activities of daily living, mobility, and sports. And unfortunately, these upper extremities are prone to injury with the highest prevalence of pain reported at the shoulder joints. And shoulder pain was mainly related to wheelchair activities, which is not surprising as, for example, um, wheelchair propulsion induces repetitive stress on the shoulder. And while other activities like transferring oneself to a chair or a bed may induce greater loads, these activities occur less frequently. And once an injury occurs, these persons immediately become totally dependent um, and may lose um, social interaction, may not be able to leave their houses anymore. Now, the most common diagnosis of shoulder pain is the subacromial pain syndrome, which is any non-traumatic shoulder problem that causes pain around the acromion. And in wheelchair users in specific, the supraspinatus and the biceps tendon, which you can see here, that both run through the subacromial space are the most common sites of injury. Now, tendons have a high metabolic activity, which means that they can adapt to changing demands. And here you can see that the tendon is comprised of collagen fibers. And this really offers the opportunity to strengthen the tendon by training and make them stiffer. However, with overloading, uh, we can also induce micro damage to these collagen fibers, which may lead to chronic tendon degeneration and ultimately to tendon rupture. And on the left hand side here, we can see an example of a biceps tendon in between these dark white lines. And here we can clearly see the distinct black and white lines that represent the collagen fibers. So this is a nice and healthy biceps tendon. And then on the other side, we see a biceps tendon of a wheelchair rugby athlete. And here we can see that the lines are much less clear. They are disorganized. The tendon also seems thicker. There may be some fluids in there. And while there are differences between every individual, uh, research has shown that there are chronic adaptations in the tendons of persons who are using a wheelchair. However, acute changes in tendon responses um, in the tendons of wheelchair users are still uh, unclear. Now, the impact of shoulder pain and the so far unsatisfying uh, treatment strategies really call for the need to improve injury prevention. And to do so, we need to have an in-depth understanding of all the risk factors that potentially contribute to shoulder pain. And these factors include both the demands on the shoulder as well as the capacity to meet those demands. And previously identified risk factors for shoulder pain include sex, so females are more at risk. Then also injury characteristics. As I mentioned before, uh, people who have a higher lesion will have less functioning, um, but also um, the lesion can be complete or incomplete. So a complete lesion means that there is no functioning below the level of injury, while with an incomplete lesion, there may still be partial functioning. Then we also have the subacromial space. If this is reduced, this may affect the structures that are in the space. For example, uh, during wheelchair propulsion itself, uh, we have a reduction of the subacromial space. And then also a reduced range of motion and reduced muscle strength were found prior to the onset of pain. And tendons degenerate over time and with loading. So um, it's clear that age and time since injury will also play a role. Now the demands on the shoulder are affected by the shoulder loads, the body weight, the propulsion by a mechanics. As you may have seen, there are different styles of propulsion. Some uh, persons really propel with these short strokes, so they push and then they immediately bring the hands backwards, while um, other persons will use these long and smooth strokes where they actually drop the hands 
um, to go down and then come back, which is a more circular movement. And it's actually recommended to propel with these longs and these smooth, long and smooth strokes because this is expected to reduce the shoulder loads. And of course, also the wheelchair and its setup um, should not be neglected. And based on these risk factors for shoulder pain, uh, current guidelines to preserve shoulder health recommend to propel with these long and these smooth strokes and, um, to, um, and include training strategies that improve the capacity of the wheelchair users. But having said that, it is important to note that the muscles that are supposed to stabilize this mobile joint were found to be prone to fatigue. And fatigue is a complex phenomenon in which physical and cognitive functioning is limited by interactions between performance fatigability and perceived fatigability. So performance fatigability is a reduction in a discrete measure of performance and perceived fatigability describes sensations that regulate the integrity of the performer. And this is the definition from Inoka and Duchateau in 2016. But it's and fatigue may play a role, um, may affect the shoulder loads and may play a role in the development of uh, pathology and pain in these wheelchair users. But so far it's unclear how fatiguing wheelchair propulsion really affects these risk factors for shoulder pain. And this is how we come to the aim of my PhD thesis, which was to examine the effect of fatiguing wheelchair propulsion on risk factors for shoulder pain in persons with SCI. And the specific aims were threefold. Firstly, to describe the prevalence of musculoskeletal shoulder pain and associated factors in the Swiss SCI population. Secondly, to define how fatiguing wheelchair propulsion changes these biomechanical and neuromuscular risk factors for shoulder pain in persons with SCI. And finally, also to really look at the tendon level and to see if there are acute changes in tendon appearance with this fatiguing propulsion. And these three specific aims were addressed with four individual studies, of which each um, resulted in a separate publication. And now I will lead you through each of these studies. So the first study aimed to describe the prevalence and associated factors of shoulder pain. And to do so, we investigated uh, cross-sectional data within the community survey of 2012 of the Swiss Spinal Cord Injury Cohort Study. And the Swiss Spinal Cord Injury Cohort Study is really a comprehensive cohort study that aims to capture the lived experience of persons with a spinal cord injury. And in the 2012 survey, we had 1,549 Swiss residents with a spinal cord injury. And this also includes non-wheelchair users. And the dependent variable here was musculoskeletal shoulder pain in the last week. So we just asked them, did you experience pain? And if they said yes, and they marked the shoulder region, then we would identify them or mark them as having pain. And then the independent variables were risk factors associated with shoulder pain, including uh, sociodemographic, socioeconomic variables, but also health conditions like spasticity and contractures, as well as um, if they were using a wheelchair or not and how much they were um, performing sporting activities. And then we performed logistic regression analyses to answer our question. And in this study, we found that 36% of the persons with a spinal cord injury have shoulder pain. And this is almost 30% higher than the general population. And if we look at wheelchair users in specific within the sample, also they had a greater prevalence of pain of about 40%. And when we controlled for all the covariables, we also found um, that females, as you can see here, this is the odds ratio, they had, were almost twice as likely to have pain as compared to the males. So they were more likely to have pain. Furthermore, persons with a higher lesion, as I mentioned before, the tetraplegia, as well as a complete lesion, had higher odds of pain as compared with those with an incomplete and a lower lesion level. Then also the uh, health condition spasticity and contractures were associated with higher odds of shoulder pain. Now the following quasi-experimental studies all had a pre-test, post-test design and directly aimed to look at the effect of fatiguing wheelchair propulsion. And to do so, we implemented the so-called figure eight fatiguing protocol. So 
As you can see in the video here, during the protocol, the wheelchair users are asked to propel as fast as possible along this eight-shaped course for three times four minutes. And the course includes starts and stops, turns, uh, right turns and left turns, and um, accelerations and decelerations. And this is the only protocol so far has been uh, validated and induces fatigue with overground propulsion. And because the effect of fatigue is task dependent, and also because of uh, comparability reasons, we use the same uh, fatiguing protocol. The second study in specific then aimed to identify uh, changes in biomechanical neuromuscular risk factors for shoulder pain in startup propulsion biomechanics. And uh, we did this uh, with a, by investigating a sample of 26 wheelchair users with a spinal cord injury who did not have any shoulder problems. And this project was conducted at the Human Engineering Research Laboratories at the University of Pittsburgh, where all the wheelchair users performed the figure eight in the lab. And we then collected um, the forces that they applied on the push rim with the use of an instrumented wheel, which you can see here. This wheel is called a smart wheel and has three force transducers from which we can then calculate the forces applied on the push rim. And we would then look at the start of propulsion by mechanics at the really beginning of the fatiguing protocol when they are still in a fresh state and at the end. And what I mean with startup propulsion by mechanics is really the first strokes after every complete stop. As you saw in the video, they make a complete stop and then they have to accelerate. And the first first strokes um, are the strokes before steady state has and maximum velocity was reached. And then we performed repeated measures on OVAS to look at the changes at the beginning and the end of the fatiguing protocol. And we defined fatigue with a reduction in performance fatigability or a reduction in the maximum velocity at the end of the protocol and a change in the perceived fatigability or an increased rate of perceived exertion. And you may be familiar with this. This is the Borg scale that goes from six to 20, ranging from no exertion at all to maximum exertion when they cannot continue anymore. And then what was found was that at the end of the fatiguing protocol, the wheelchair users were propelling with a significantly reduced contact time in the first stroke of startup propulsion. So after they had the complete, the complete stop, the first stroke when they were accelerating. And this may seem um, not really an important finding, but a, a reduction in the contact time really means, um, as you can imagine, that there is a greater impact on the shoulder because there is less time to apply uh, the, the force. And so even this is only in the first stroke, the wheelchair users perform between 200 and 400 starts and stops per day. So this was really an important finding. And furthermore, what we found was that the persons who propelled with a shorter contact time at the beginning of the protocol had a greater reduction in their performance at the end of the fatiguing task. To further answer our research questions, we then performed a Swiss key nested project. And this means that we recruited 50 wheelchair users from the Swiss spinal cord injury cohort study. And we then invited these wheelchair users to come to our lab in Switzerland, in Nottwil, where you can see we had an ultrasound device, the treadmill, um, and the fatiguing task they actually performed in the corridor. And so they all came for a four hour measurement sessions where we conducted several measurements before, during, and after the fatiguing task. And now um, I will lead you through the different measurements for the next two uh, projects. So the third study uh, aimed to look at changes in biomechanical and neuromuscular risk factors for shoulder pain and to identify persons who are susceptible to fatigue. Unfortunately, in the study, we had to exclude 16 um, of our participants because of technical issues with the smart wheel and the EMG system. But we still had 34 wheelchair users with a spinal cord injury at T2 or below. So they all had a paraplegia and they did not have any shoulder problems. And what we looked at for this project was really um, the treadmill propulsion task at a fixed power output before and after the fatiguing protocol. And we can standardize the power output by measuring, so before the, 
the measurements, we measure the rolling resistance of every individual. And then we can add additional weight in this IKEA bag here, which is connected with a rope. There is another wheel here that is out of the picture. And then the rope goes all the way down and is attached to the back of the wheelchair. And this is, serves as a sort of a heavy backpack and allows us to standardize the power outputs. And we would then look at 30 seconds of treadmill propulsion at 25 and 45 watts pre post the figure eight protocol. And during this treadmill propulsion, we measured uh, EMG from the pectoralis, the deltoidea sparse acromialis, the biceps, and the upper and the lower trap. And we also again collected the propulsion by mechanics with the smart wheel, which is uh, shown here. We then performed repeated measures ANOVAs to identify changes pre post fatigue. And we used T tests to compare persons who we identified as being susceptible to fatigue. And um, in this study, we found that following the fatiguing intervention, the wheelchair users were capable to propel at the same power outputs. However, um, they compensated. But first I wanna show you how we again identified fatigue. And this was again also with a change in the performance fatigability. So a change in the heart rate this time and a change in the perceived uh, fatigability. Again, a change in perceived exertion. And um, persons who had an increase in both of these measures of more than two times the standard error of measurement were identified as being susceptible to fatigue. And these were 47% uh, of the sample. And so, as I mentioned before, we saw that they were capable to profile at the same power outputs, but that the wheelchair users compensated with a change in their neuromuscular activation. So there was an increase uh, EMG as a percentage of their MVCs in the pectoralis, the deltoideus, and the upper trapezius. And this may lead to muscular imbalances, which was found as an important factor in the development of musculoskeletal disorders. Furthermore, these wheelchair users compensated with a change in the push angle. And similarly, as the contact time, when the push angle is reduced, this will increase the loads on the shoulder. And indeed, when we looked at these people who we identified as being susceptible to fatigue, we saw that they had greater changes in both of these measures. But who are these persons susceptible to fatigue? So they had more often a complete lesion and they were older at the age of injury. Furthermore, they were propelling with a shorter push angle and a greater maximum resultant force. So they had less efficient propulsion by mechanics. Um, and this really supports the need of wheelchair training programs. Furthermore, we found that they had a reduced muscular activation and that they had greater anaerobic capacity, greater maximum push strength, but no difference in activity levels. And this um, may be related to the fact that athletes who train for uh, aerobic capa anaerobic capacity um, are more susceptible to fatigue as compared to those who train for aerobic capacity. So then we come to the final study where we really wanted to look at the shoulder tendons. And for this study, we could include our 50, uh, so the entire sample, the 50 wheelchair users. Again, uh, so the same sample, paraplegia and no shoulder problems. And here we looked um, at the biceps tendon and the supraspinatus tendon by using quantitative ultrasound protocols. And these are protocols that have been developed and validated previously and that we took at the early beginning and at the final end of our measurement session. And to, to uh, perform these protocols, we use a small metal marker. If you look good, you can see it here, which is taped to the skin and which results in this interference pattern on the ultrasound images. So these uh, black lines, vertical lines, which are marked with the arrows here and here. And from this pattern, we could then identify the region of interest of the tendons with limited error um, in change of probe location, pre post the fatiguing task. And we looked at the tendon thickness, but also at the average grayscale, the echogenicity ratio, and the contrast of the tendons. And our dependent variables were then the absolute difference in these tendon characteristics, and the independent variables were risk factors associated with shoulder pain. And we used linear regression analyses to answer our question. 
And here it was found that following the fatiguing intervention, overall there was, uh, and when controlling for all our co-variables, there was a significant reduction in supraspinatus tendons, uh, supraspinatus tendon thickness by 1.4 millimeters. And this may be explained by the general res tendon response to loading, which is a creep or alignment of the collagen fibers in the direction of the applied stress. However, interestingly, we also found that there was a positive association with the change in supraspinatus thickness and body weight. And in fact, persons who are heavier even presented an increase in thickness. And this may be associated by, um, with reactive tendinopathy, which is an acute influx of water into the tendon in response to overload, which um, may re reduce the local strain. And uh, this could have been the case in persons who are heavier. However, um, we don't know um, how these changes affected muscular activation, how the changes in the muscular activations would have affected the tendon changes, and uh, we also don't know the long-term consequences. So this study found that, um, or the thesis found that 36% of the persons with a spinal cord injury reported shoulder pain, and that following fatiguing wheelchair propulsion, the wheelchair users compensated with a reduction in their push angle, change in neuromuscular activation, and an overall reduction in supraspinatus tendon thickness. And these cha changes may play a role in the development of pathology and pain. And uh, these changes really um, demonstrate the importance of improving uh, resilience against fatigue in these wheelchair users, which we may be able to do um, by improving propulsion technique, so really propelling with these long and these smooth strokes, also by improving the aerobic capacity, uh, for example, with maybe high intensity interval training, um, as this offers the opportunity to improve the aerobic capacity of the fast muscle fibers, which are typically recruited during daily life activities of these wheelchair users. And finally, also to improve a neuromuscular activation. And this, this thesis is the result of collaboration across multiple countries and really um, offers, offered the opportunity to cover a broad range of risk factors for shoulder pain. However, as every study is limited, we did not have any information on the setup of the wheelchair or the aerobic capacity. Then the use of the unified definition of fatigue, as well as the same uh, overground fatigue protocol strengthens this thesis, as well as the pretest post test design. However, because we did not in our experimental studies include persons who had pain, we cannot, and because we did not do any longitudinal studies, we cannot make any causal inferences between fatigue and shoulder pain. And finally, um, this study is really unique because of its population-based uh, study samples, which hasn't been done before. However, we are also limited by our inclusion and our exclusion criteria. And before I move on to the implications and the future perspectives, I wanna conclude here uh, that the aim was really to examine the effects of fatiguing wheelchair propulsion on risk factors for shoulder pain in persons with SCI. And then we found that this fatiguing propulsion potentially contributes to the development of pathology and that intervention programs should improve aerobic capacity, muscular activation and the propulsion technique. And that future research, research uh, could assess long-term consequences and validate these uh, training strategies. Now, this thesis has made an impact on uh, wheelchair users with a spinal cord injury living in Switzerland through the distribution of an article that we published in Paraplegie, which was uh, distributed in German and in French in 70,000 prints, and which includes recommendations for these wheelchair users to prevent shoulder pain based on uh, the evidence so far, also including the importance of uh, professionally adjusting your wheelchair um, as well as lowering body weight, uh, using a proper technique and so forth. And then the impact on the clinical and the academic setting was um, presented by um, the third article that was selected as a continuing medical education article. And um, 
as one of my presentations uh, at the conference is fostered an international collaboration by an invitation of Professor Doki Vicky Tolfrey, who is director of the Peter Harrison Center for Disability Sport and professor at the University of Loughborough. And in January, I went there for 10 days where we collected ultrasound images with the Great Britain wheelchair rugby athletes. Um, and this was really a unique experience. And, we, and they want to include these ultrasound uh, testings uh, through the, in their yearly uh, testing of the athletes. And so we publish data of one of the, um, of the athletes at the ISBS, but we're currently working um, to publish the entire data set. And so um, the unique data set that resulted from the Swiss Kinesis project really offers uh, the opportunity to also do um, use in further data analysis. For example, as you may have seen, we also collected kinematics and we plan to uh, calculate the glenohumeral contact force and do uh, musculoskeletal modeling so we can actually see what is happening at the shoulder. And then uh, we need to find, uh, we need to identify the long-term consequences of these fatigue induced changes and also intervention studies that really preserve shoulder health. And, and, but now musculoskeletal research has stagnate, stagnated because of the limited understanding how muscles and tendons interact. And we can only really understand if we're able to quantify tendon and muscle strain continuously during dynamic movements in vivo. And this is actually uh, why I'm here um, to perform this postdoc project um, where we want to validate this passive electronic strain sensor and uh, be able to quantify tendon and muscle strain continuously. And this project is funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation and I'm enormously grateful for the Human Performance Lab and uh, Professor Dr. Walter Herzog for having me here and uh, conducting this project. And I really hope that um, later on we can uh, test this sensor in humans and maybe also in the wheelchair users and their shoulders and see more closely what is actually happening. So these are the publications that resulted from my uh, thesis, the references, and I want to end with the words, you'll never walk alone and uh, really um, thank my uh, supervisors, Dr. Michael Bollinger from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Armin Gemperli from the University of Lucerne, my close supervisor, Dr. Ursina Arnett from Switzerland, external experts, Dr. Anne Kohls from Belgium and Dr. Timo Hinrichs from Switzerland, the managing director and the director, Miriam Brach and Dr. Gerald Stucki from the Swiss Paraplegic Research, as well as everyone uh, who helped with the recruitment, the data collection, all the participants, um, the sport medicine for using their ultrasound device. This really could not have happened without all of them. And I also want to thank my family, my partner, my uh, friends from the rowing team, um, my colleagues, also those who couldn't be uh, there anymore at my defense, but who will always uh, remember. And uh, yes, I want to finish with this picture from a hike after the day after my defense with Michael Bollinger and, and the shoulder health and mobility team. And this was really the best way to finish off. So um, with that, I want to thank you for listening and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions and open the discussion. Thank you, Ziska. It was a really great talk, I think. Um, if you have any questions, please click the raise hand button or just even quickly shake your hands in front of your web camera, then I'll be trying to catch and get you in. The floor is now open for questions. Actually, let me start for, uh, for the first question, Ziska. Um, so, so in your fourth studies, if I, uh, if I am not if I'm if I didn't make any mistakes, so you measure the tendon thickness after um, you said quick um, to, to measure the acute effect of the fatiguing, right? Um, would there be any speculated um, relationship between those acute effects on tendon and also related to the chronic effects of the tendon, like pain or degeneration of the tendon property as well? Um, so yes, we, we don't really know um, what's happening on the long term, but what we can expect is that, so we see overall reduction, but it seems that the response is different 
in different persons and those who are heavier, but also uh, people who have a different acromic humeral distance presented different changes. And um, all I would um, speculate or think is that if there is insufficient time to recover in response to these acute changes, this may lead uh, to chronic degeneration. So it's not necessarily, a, it's normal that we see changes in response to activity. I think it's more the problem that we don't really know um, how much is too much and how much rest do they need to recover from these changes. And um, that would then result maybe even in strengthening of the tendon, mm -hmm. um, but not an overload. So I think the problem is really that we don't know what would be the perfect amount to improve the tendon structures and what would be too much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think I see Brian, you have a question. Please go ahead. Hi, Siska. Thank you for your awesome presentation. Um, can, you guys can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. So I found it really interesting that you mentioned the tendon swelling was more significant in the participants who were a little heavier. So I have two questions about that. One was uh, in your very first study of the, pop of the survey, did you guys see anything related, uh, relating body weight to the risk of their shoulder injuries? And my second question is, going back to the third and fourth study, if do you, would you suspect if the lighter participant had gone on with the testing for a little longer, would they, do you think they would display similar amount of tendon swelling just because of the loading? So yeah. Thank you. Those are really good questions. Um, so with regards to the first one, in the questionnaire, we don't have actually body weight, but there are other studies that found uh, positive associations with body weight and uh, pathology in tendon, uh, in tendon pathology. So there's actually um, several studies that show that a higher body weight is associated with shoulder pathology, but also with wrist pathology in wheelchair users. Um, so this is also why it has been recommended to, um, to reduce the body weight in these wheelchair users. Um, with regards to the second question, um, sorry, I, I missed it. What was again the second oh, question? Um, just um, because you mentioned the, the lighter ah, participants, the yeah. tendon actually showed a, a shrinkage while yeah. the heavier ones had a you know, increase in size. Do you think yeah. the lighter participants will eventually have a swollen tendon? Um, that's also, that's, that's a really good question. I don't know, um, really. Yeah, the only thing I, um, it could be, it could be the case. I don't know, that would be interesting to see. But um, I'm, it may be the case, but I think that I mean, all of the all of the athletes really pushed hard, and even those that were lighter may have. So they fatigued at the similar. They I would I would expect that also in those that were lighter we would have seen the increase in thickness because the loading was already so high. They were really going maximal. Mm -hmm. So I don't expect uh, this to happen, but it could be. Yeah, I don't know. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I also see Art Kuo. You have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, my question is about uh, pain. And I'm just curious, what is um, the kind of pain they're feeling? So um, are they feeling, say, joint pain, meaning uh, nerve endings within the joint? Or um, I guess another possibility is there, there are a few nerve endings, I think, intended, but not very many. Or uh, maybe it's a neural transmitter thing where it's kind of like a general uh, feeling of pain, but not, not anything specific to um, direct loading. So I'm, I'm just curious, what, what do you think is, is uh, causing the pain or what is sensing the pain? Um, 
so the pain is is really specific at the shoulder joint and for example when we do an empty can test um, they would experience pain in the shoulder or uh, when they do these specific activities they would experience pain at the specific joint and they these would these persons with spinal cord injury actually have um also um a lot of general pain um so pain is just a, a very big problem in these persons but studies have really shown that the pain is associated with the loading and with the specific activities that they do and also um if they have for example um it's it's chronic pain but then also accidents can happen when they move their wheelchair from the car um, because they have to transfer and they they can dislocate their shoulder so there's really a lot of loading that's happening there so i would um, expect that this is um, has it's it's really focused it's really um, related to the amount of loading of the propulsion activity and we've also seen in a study that is um, uh, going to be published soon is that if we look at persons with pain, that those who have really high levels of pain also use different propulsion techniques. So they are propelling, they have um, a higher, so the, the force development is higher in their stroke. Um, and we don't know if they propel differently because of the pain or, or if this causes the pain, but there is an association there. I don't know if that's answering your question. Yes, yeah, so I, I think so. So would you say that, um, that the, the relationship to uh, tendon is really indirect, as in you load the joint, the joint feels pain, and then that's almost always a cor well correlated with, uh, with tendon stress. Yeah, and, and actually these, if you, there, there was a study that looked at uh, 50 wheelchair users, and all of the wheelchair users had uh, signs of supraspinatus tendinopathy. They did not all have pain, but they all had uh, pathology. And um, not all the wheelchair users have pathology, but it's, it seems that this, this task is very demanding on their structures. I see, thanks. Okay, I also see Arash, uh, you have a question? Yeah. So uh, thank you for the great present, uh, presentation. I have a question, actually it's a two part question. Uh, one part is about the, how this, uh, I'm, I'm curious about this force profile. How does it look? Does it have any impact like force over there uh, when you look at it? And also if, if these people also have any, uh, any sort of uh, stress fracture in their, I don't know, humerus or maybe the radius or ulna? Um, so here we can see, you're talking about the force profile during propulsion, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So this is actually the applied force during the push stroke. Um, and the black one is pre-fatigue and the red one was post-fatigue. So this is um, normalized to 100%. And we didn't find any significant changes um, in there. So, but this is how the profile looks like. And actually what we see in the people with pain is that this peak is higher. So they have really this here, a steeper and then a higher peak um, of the first part of the force. Um, so yeah, this is how the force uh, development looks like. Then with regards to other pathology, I am not sure I, would be able to give you an answer to that but most um, we've had a study where they did MRI um, examinations and really most of the the diagnosis was related to the tendons so it's not it's definitely not a lot but I would not be able to give you exact information perfect thank you uh, Brent do you have a question Yeah, I've, I've got um, a, a couple questions and they're all sort of along the same lines and they, and they really have to do with this idea of like your, the amount of function that the individual with the spinal cord has, um, like even when you, you know, you can have, you can be motor complete, motor incomplete, but even within those two classifications, there's an amount of function that, you know, some people that are motor 
motor, motor incomplete might have a little bit more function than others that are motor incomplete. And, I, I, and I'm just wondering if it's the people that have a little bit more upper extremity function or a little bit more independent, if they're the ones that are at an increased risk for um, overuse injury, just because they're able to ambulate more and get around more and move around more. Um, whereas maybe if you weren't as functioning, you'd have um, maybe not as higher loads, but the capacity of your tissues would, would be less because they'd be more atrophied. So I guess my question is, you know, there's loads and then there's tissue capacity. And how does the level of function or the level of completeness of injury uh, influence that? Yeah, that's a really good point. That's actually very important. Um, it's as you say, even if you look at person with paraplegia, you have huge difference in between those and huge differences in functioning. Um, and so it's very hard to really um, standardize these that's why we also looked at person with a paraplegia and tried to focus uh, at, on this. But um, overall, actually, um, so we found in our study that persons with lower level and incomplete had less pain. And overall, it has been always found that persons with a higher lesion level will be, um, have more problems. And I think this really, even though they, as you say, they may be able to do less, they really lack the core muscles to stabilize them. And it's just the higher the, the lesion, the more they purely rest on their shoulders. And I would say, or rely on their shoulders. And I would say that even though they may be able to do less in terms of their capacity, it will still be much higher than if you would compare the loads or the demands and the capacity in the people who have a lower lesion level because they are just more capable to also strengthen their core and have a better position uh, and also the way how they propel. So, yeah, it's, it's a, I think it's very important that a lot of persons are afraid to do too much because they think they will overload. But so far it hasn't really found that it's really because they're doing more sports or they're doing more propulsion that they will have pain. It's more related to how are they doing it and how are they trained. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I wasn't thinking about that before, but if you're, yeah, if you have a lower level lesion and more upper function, maybe you can use a, a lot more core and trunk for propulsion and rely less on the, on the smaller shoulder muscles specifically to so that makes sense to me. My next question, and it's sort of along those same lines, is um, if you do look at some of those people with lower level um, lesions that are really independent, the ones that can throw themselves into cars by themselves and lift up their wheelchairs and throw them in the back seat, and and they're they're almost you know 100% functioning, just they just can't use their legs. Um, if you ever look at the transfers of those movements that they do, like those are incredibly explosive movements. When they throw themselves from a wheelchair onto the bed or into a car or anything like that. So I'm just wondering, and I, and I, I think they do that several, several times a day. I'm just wondering if there's, is there research that's been done where people have followed people with SEI, high functioning people with SEI, and just sort of quantified how many transfers do you do a day? Uh, how many, how much do you wheelchair per day or anything like that? And, and so if there is, uh, has anybody been able to, to relate the number of transfers, transfers per day to shoulder pain or overuse injury or anything like that? Um, so there have been studies that uh, we're looking at the amount of um, transfers and activities um, and there have been relations with uh, transfer, also the quality of the transfers and pathology, um, because transfers are, as you say, it's, it's also very important um, movement that is very low, like inducing great loads. And so, yes, there is associations with that. And, um, but now what's, I think what's coming up more and more now, and that's also the goal of the research is to 
follow them with um, activity monitors over longer time and follow them over years. And actually they want to include this data in the Swiss Spinal Cord Injury Cohort Study. So they would have also biomechanical data, not just questionnaire data. So I think there have, have been uh, studies that looked at this, but it has not been maybe not explored enough and enough over time to really see um, the developments there. Thanks. Okay, I thought I saw Walter, you raised your hand before and then now the hand is gone. Okay, now please go ahead, Walter. Uh, yeah, I, I had it raised because I, I, I wanted to follow up a bit uh, after Art's question because he asked about pain and I had a couple of pain questions as well. And the first one is that um, is pain in spinal cord in injured patient affected in any way or pain perception? Or in other words, you know, if you have a partial, a partial uh, transection of your spinal cord, is it possible that a lot of your motor function is impaired, but your proprioception is not, or the other way around, that your proprioception might be almost gone and you don't feel anything at all, not much pain, but your motor function might actually be still very good. Or is the assumption always, let's say, in a partial injury that motor function and proprioception and pain perception are affected to a similar degree? Um, so I'm not, I'm not a pain expert, but so there is neuropathic pain that is pain below the lesion level. Um, yeah. So this can occur. And but we were looking at persons with a paraplegia, so we wouldn't expect that this would affect it because the shoulders um, would be below, uh, above the lesion level. But so there is, pain is definitely a very complicated um, aspect and it's not always related to the motor. It's, it's just, uh, you mentioned an interesting fact and that was that, you know, uh, some of these people have uh, generalized pain in other parts of the body as well. And I seem to remember once having seen pain studies where people were saying that if you have lots of pain, generalized pain, that you're much more sensitive uh, to pain at a certain point rather than, rather than people who otherwise are pain free. And uh, you know, I was wondering if that uh, uh, might play a role as well in pain perception. Um, you mean like depending on the on the characteristics of the person and uh, yes Let, let's say for example let's say for example i have osteoarthritis i think that's the example that i heard and you only have uh, you know the only joint affected is the knee and you have a certain amount of pain there then the argument goes goes if somebody has also osteoarthritis in the hand and shoulders and hips and the whole body is kind of painful that if you touch their knee, the sensitivity test, they will be much more sensitive to touch and feel that there's much more pain there because their, their body somehow is sensitized to that rather yeah. than somebody who theoretically speaking has exactly the same condition, but only in that particular choice. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, can play a role and is very important to consider. And these, uh, these uh, is shoulder joint over injury. Is that essentially the only, the only overuse injury that you see? You mentioned a bit also like, uh, I mean, there's obviously a lot of back involvement for some of these people. Do they also get back problems or, uh, or, yes. or not? Yes, it's um, also hands and elbow. Um, okay. There's a lot of, I think the, the, the thing is that with shoulder pain, it's, it's the most um, prevalent, but there's, there's a lot of pain. Um, so another thing that I was interested in is that, um, you know, that you were talking about contact time, for example, and I would assume that contact time depends very much also on the speed. You know, if I assume I go through about the same range of motion, and if I go very fast compared to very slow, then the contact time would be would be changing. And uh, 
when when you looked at contact times in this context, did you did you check for speed as well? And if that's all explained by speed, or was a changes in contact time independent of the speed? Um, so in in the third and the fourth well, in the third study, we uh, standardized the velocity. Um, so yeah. the, the speed was consistent on the treadmill. And then in yeah. the second study, we actually um, also normalized to velocity and we still saw the reduction in contact time. There was actually a further question that I had because I thought that on the treadmill, you standardized the speed and did you also standardize the resistance that you applied so they, they had the same performance? Yeah, the power outputs. Yeah, so and was that very easy or was that really easy for some people and really hard for other people and would that affect the results you know if i can i think one one value was 45 watts and let's yeah. assume you know 47 watts is my limit and for somebody else 147 watts is the limit you know i would yeah. assume that would make a tremendous difference in in how they how they do that yeah that's true um so the 25 watt was quite easy for everyone um, with the 45 watts, it was uh, doable, but we selected these watts also based on previous experiences. So it was demanding, but all of the wheelchair users could do it. Um, we did provide some familiarization because the hardest part is just for them to get used to this weight that was in the back. But then once they were familiar with it, they could do it. But definitely there was a range in that for some, it was less hard than for others. So I think this is something that is important, but if we, this is the only way how we can really standardize it and allow treadmill propulsion that is not on um, yeah. ergometers. Well, one, so that's a limitation. That saw, yeah. one of the things that I saw was that, uh, uh, you know, whenever they propulse, they would go a little bit forward and lift the bag up. And then when in the release phase, they would let go. And I was thinking if I was a wheelchair user, I would want to minimize that acceleration and deceleration. And therefore I would try to, I would try to push as long as I can slowly and then very quickly change. So I would try to have a very short um, recovery phase where I let go of the chair so that, so that that uh, up and down variation of the, of the bag would be minimized. It seemed that would be, would be the best strategy. Yeah, I mean, it's true that it's, it's definitely not perfect. Um, but from obser observation, we first let them propel on the treadmill and then we slowly add weight. And there were not really obvious differences in how they were propelling. Yeah, yeah, so they, I don't yeah. think where they were really thinking it through like that. When people have done similar things with runners, you know, that they try to suspend them or retain them or laterally stabilize them and very often they use these bungee cords these very long bungee cords and they are essentially you know they are very extensible so the force doesn't really change very very much with, with quite a bit of elongation and if you had a bungee cord there at a certain thing then i think the the variation uh, might might maybe not be quite as big i, I don't know i don't know because here you have an inertial weight that then you bring in, whereas with the bungee cord, then you would eliminate that inertial weight. Um, the other thing that I had is, um, do you tell people how to sit in their wheelchair? And you know, like, like when I go on a bike, or when, people, when, you, when you teach people how to go on a bike, you know, you adjust the bike and this and that, and some people are tall and some are short and so on. Uh, do people very carefully adjust their wheelchair and is there like an optimal position that, that that is recommended that people should have you know like in cycling they say you should sit at such a height that this and this happens is that similar in wheelchair that is there's a carefully uh, careful procedure and how depending on the tallness and and so on you you, you sit in the chair yeah so in um, normally so how it goes in Switzerland is that the persons so there's Orthotech um, who will uh, um, provide the wheelchairs and they will be adjusted and there are really there are recommendations on the um, how the shoulder position should be the elbow position relative to the wheel axle so we can move them higher up lower up more forward or more backwards 
Um, and so they will adjust the wheelchair based on the individual, then how they have to sit. I mean, they can still sit, change their position, how they feel. Sure. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. But there, there are these adjustments. I think it and depends is, on the country and, and the procedures, yeah. how much these are followed, but yeah. And do you know if those procedures are based on some mechanical insight, like do they minimize the work that has to be performed by the muscles in order to get the same propulsion or, or yeah. is this just completely a trial and error type of thing? Um, no, it's based on, on research and there, okay. they have yeah, been yeah. tested different positions and yeah. So when I see racers, you know, there's these people that do wheelchair racing, then they usually seem to be leaning very, very much forward. And obviously they go very fast. So they have these incredibly quick um, propulsions, but they do it very, at a very low rate, like on the flat, when you see marathon racers on a flat, I would guess they, they only give like one push every two or three seconds, but then they do it very hard, you know, very quick. And uh, they lean forward. And, and I assume that's not really a good everyday position. I would assume that's a very uncomfortable position that the racers just adopt to maximize performance, but not really to maximize or minimize injury risk. Do you know anything about wheelchair racing? <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Um... It's true, they, they really lean forward because they have this extra reach. Uh, and I've seen also older an older woman who was around 70 who was still perform, propelling like this in her daily life um, and who didn't have any problems with her shoulder. So I guess it also has to do with individual preferences and how your body is adjusted to it. Um, and and what the advantages of this leaning forward is that you can really maximize the push. So you would have less strokes, but you would have more efficient so, so strokes. It, so it gives you a better position for pushing. Uh, yeah. Pushing hard, yeah. I am not sure how it really affects the shoulder joints. Um, well, those people has... usually have very big shoulders and arms, so they look I mean, the best, the best wheelchair yeah, yeah. races look very, very developed in their upper body and uh, shoulders, they're you know, very strong athletes. Yeah. Good, yes. thank you. Um, yep, I think we have a couple of more minutes for any short or last question. Yes, Brent, please go ahead. I, I'm surprised Walter didn't ask this one. So Walter always talks about um, in cycling people talking about trying to um, pedal as smooth and circular as possible to be maximally efficient. Uh, but the interesting thing is that you're very inefficient when you pedal that way because you can't you can't generate enough you can't generate a, a lot of force, and so you really end up overworking to to try to to try to propel yourself forward. So I'm just wondering um, in regards to, you know, it, it seems like the same thing is going on with the wheelchair in the field of, of wheelchair propulsion. People are saying, let's do these smooth round strokes, I, I, I think. And, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if anybody has really looked at that. Is it really, um, is it really more efficient and maybe less um, potentially injurious if if you're propelling yourself in this smooth circular motion as opposed to just maybe sort of trying to go, you know, at a 45 degree angle kind of downward? So there is a study, um, actually I have this results here that really compared these different propulsion styles um, so this is muscle stress. Sorry, I have to prove here. So here we have muscle stress and we had also muscle power. 
uh, and then these are the different ones. So this is the shorts, so the forwards and backwards. Then we have people that go upwards, and then you can go uh, do like a little up and then downwards, and then we have the totally circular. So this is called double loop, and this is semicircular. And then you can see um, muscle stress and uh, muscle power at these different, um, all of these different ones. And if we look at the, for example, the muscle power, um, what we see is that the. Um, can so you just here, um, can you just quickly just oh yeah, just yeah. use the cursor to show me what you're looking at. I'm sorry. Okay. So here we have the. So the R is always the, the very short one, and then the semicircular would be the most, the biggest one. So it's always here, the highest up is the arch and then the semicircular, and then you would see the loads. And actually, when we um, look at the muscle stress, there was the least stress in the single loop and the, and the semicircular ones. But it seemed that the arching one would have higher uh, muscle stress. So here we can see the overall time averaged muscle stress in the different conditions. So for the contact time, for the recovery and for the full cycle. So you see that the double loop and the semicircular have less stress. And um, yeah. And that's normalized at a, that's a, that's at a specific speed, right? This is. Yes, normal. yes, yeah. So there is, it's, it should be less stressful, the, the, these propulsion styles. Um, I don't know, because Walter was mentioning this before, if there was oxygen uptake during the different right. styles. I don't know of any study that measured that, um, but it's actually more efficient and less stressful. Okay. Okay. Since, um, since, since, since Brent talked about cycling, I, I was wondering, you know, sometimes I have seen uh, people in a wheelchair try to go uphill. And uh, in fact, when you come from uh, McEwen Hall at the University of Calgary into our building, there's a little ramp going up. And, and on a couple of occasions, I helped people in a wheelchair to go up there because they, they were struggling. And is there a wheelchair where you have like a gear ratio where you can push on a wheel that's kind of parallel to the wheel that touches the ground and it's much easier and it has kind of a gearing that allows you like in a mountain bike to have a very low gear where you use little force and then you go slow as well or are all wheelchairs that are hand driven, are they all directly connected with the actual wheel and the ground? And so however fast you push, that's how fast you go. No, actually there, there are these kinds of wheelchairs that have a handle. Um, there's also, um, for example, even a wheelchair where you push backwards while you go forwards. And ah. uh, so you would be training more the back muscles and so there's lots of different things. There's, you also have wheels that are like an electrical bike that would, you yeah. would push less and you would propel more. I think the problem you is- have a, Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and Go ahead. Um, what's actually the, the best alternative for the shoulder at least is you also have a wheel where you do like, the, so you have a, something that you attach to the front of the wheelchair and you do this forward circular movements. Kind of it's a like a hand bike. Motion. Yeah, it's like a hand yeah. bike, but it's it's something that you attach to the wheelchair. Yeah. And then um, yeah. I think the problem with all of these things is I mean they're being tested, but um they take a lot of space. They are the wheelchair gets heavier, um, it's more difficult to move around in places where you don't have a lot of space. And also it feels what people say is that it feels unnatural, like the backwards pushing. Yeah. It yeah. just feels too unnatural. The, also the handle, I haven't, like, I've seen them, but I haven't seen studies that show that they are really, I mean, uh, more effective um, and people really like it. So, so far there isn't yeah. really a, 
there are alternatives, but yeah, they are not really that. I think the, the ones like the electrical uh, bike wheels, they you see now more and those you see more and more. So mm -hmm. those are a good alternative. So they have a little motor that assists you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, then you have a heavier, a heavier chair, which is annoying yeah. for carrying. Sure. Yeah. I think I also see Brent. Do you have a question? It, it just it just came to my mind. Um, are people uniquely in one of these propulsion style of groups, or is there sort of like a a, 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 a sort of like how there's a walk to run gate transition speed? Is there sort of a propulsion technique transition with with speed or? people pretty much t stick to one type of propulsion style no so so these styles are just when you observe people you you'll see them and actually they adjust depending on the on the speed on the also the power outputs uh, people will change will change their styles but you have uh, people that more really do these arch so the arching and people that will go more circular, but then you have a lot of variation in between. So yeah, it's not just black and white uh, and clear who is this person and yeah. yeah thanks. Okay, uh, as I do not see anyone raising their hands, um, I would like to thank Siska again for the interesting talk. Thank you. Um, Next week, we'll be hearing from Nate Morris, who will be speaking about neuromuscular deficit following ACL reconstruction with hamstring autograph, implications for rehabilitation, and return to sports testing. I'll see you all next week.